Yeah, I'm Robert Ferris Thompson. I'm the Colonel John Trumbull, professor of the history of art at Yale. And I was master of Timothy Dwight College, uh, which is ending July. Okay, and where are you at right now? Right now I'm in uh, one of the hippest museums in the world. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, well thank you for coming here and talking to us today. Yeah. Um, I just have a few questions to ask you, and feel free to take them wherever you yeah, want to take sure, them. Yeah, sure, man. So the first question I have for you is, uh, what experiences triggered your interest or desire to work in the field of Congo or African diasporic? A lot of things happen. Uh, first of all, I had a taste for difference. God knows why or how, but maybe it was because I was born and reared in El Paso, Texas, which is where you see three states, Chihuahua, New Mexico, and Texas, and two countries, Mexico and the U.S. And so I was at early age like the fact that the moment you cross the river, bam, a different language, Espanol, different culture, et cetera. So I got a taste of, of cross-cultural living, just living in El Paso. But then what really did it, as the years went by, I, I learned how to play boogie, uh, I, I, AKA piano blues, and did that intensely and sort of irradiated me and stored. I began to, from boogie, move out in jazz and I loved Hawaiian music, and there used to be a radio program called Hawaii Calls, and I listened re religiously. I also loved gypsy music. I loved flamenco. All these things were happening. But then, in March 1950, I went to Mexico City, and there I discovered Mambo. And that was it, because Mambo had boogie in it, it had beautiful chords in it, it was like a distillation of everything that I believed in, only it raised the power of two. And I started collecting Mambo records and anything that would shed light on it. So soon I was reading about Beve from Haiti and Candomblé from Brazil. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, now, years later, I'm finally writing a book on Mambo. But Mambo inspired me because it was super black. It was jazz, which is black. It was Afro-Cuban, which is black. It was a little touch of Moorish flamenco, which is black, or related to black, and so forth. So it's Mambo. Mambo led me to the, Mambo was the yellow brick road that led me to this. Okay, so um, can you tell us a little bit more about your book? I mean, this is one of your latest projects that is going back to Mambo. Yeah, my, my latest book is called Staccato Incandescence, the story of Mambo. And it, it shows the different Mambos, the original Cuban Mambo, the Mexican Mambo that Perez Prado brought, the New York Mambo developed by Machito Tito Puente, Tito Rodriguez, and the Bay Area Mambo developed by Cal Shader and uh, a lot of other musicians. And then the Mambo in Tokyo. I was in Tokyo last summer. And just amazed at how many dance teams there are. And they have wonderful names like Sound Cream. <laughs> Don't you love it? Sound Cream. They're one of the baddest of the of the um, Tokyo Mambo jazz dancers. So it just gets bigger and bigger. Be besides Mambo, was there a specific reason why your work um, so far, or at least to my knowledge, is focused more on the Black Atlantic and the cultural survivals? Um, carried through the transatlantic slave trade um, rather than you're talking about Tokyo now. Well, you right? can't do it all. Yeah. I've got enough to handle with Mambo and the transatlantic uh, cultural currents. There is a current that flowed to India from East Africa. There was a current that flowed into the Balkans. There were blacks that were in Zinj, a port on Montenegro. So there's an Afro-Balkan story and an Afro-Indian story, but can't do it all, man. That's the reason is just keep myself focused on that. I've got enough to do. So how long have you been at Yale, and what has kept you I started so teaching in 1966, and what keeps me there is utter academic freedom. No one said, Mambo, is that a course? No one said that. I was free to do what I wanted to do, and it's because of the tradition of academic freedom, and I'd be a fool to to go away from a place that treated me so well. Are there any misconceptions which prohibit greater understanding of your work within the field? Well, you know, every now and then you hit the wall of racism or just plain as ignorance. Mabo, what, 
why would you want to study that? I actually had a parent that complained that the student was taking a course in Mambo. He said, well, we're sending you to Yale, you're going to do that. He only thought, uh, God knows what he thought. Maybe that we, we just showed Mambo steps, like a, a dance hall thing. But Mambo's a way of life, and it's uh, also highly political, as I talked about earlier. The earlier stars all broke through, broke all kinds of color bars. And then not only that, it also brought the world's attention to the validity of Santeria, Candomblé, Palo, Abacua. If it's possible for you to look over the scope of your whole career, um, what would you say is your greatest contribution to the field? Of oh, I'd, I'd rather have some other scholar say <laughs> that. Are there any other scholars who have influenced your work? Oh, yeah, of course, W.E.B. Du Bois, not just necessarily a scholar, the Art Ensemble of Chicago, and they sparked me in the 70s, and particularly one of the wittiest of their protagonists, Bowie, Lester Bowie. The reason I love the guy is his satire. He did a satire called Jazz Death, and he pretends to be interviewed, and this guy, then he switches and becomes the interviewer, and he said, hi, I'm Jack Armstrong, and I'm from Jism Magazine, and we on the board of Jism would like to know, is jazz as we know it dead? And Lester goes, excuse me, I didn't quite get that. I'm sorry, sir, we're having a communication problem. I just don't understand anything you're saying. And then Lester says, could you kindly remove your hat? <laughs> and sort of a Dada-like thing, and witty as hell, but also getting a lot of good points in the ridiculous so-called, what Amiri Baraka calls gee whiz scholarship. Like, oh man, jazz, so wonderful. You can't learn that way. It has to be critical and sober. They were into that. Are there any other figures, any other people who've Oh, well, all the figures inspire me. Muhammad Ali, I, I lecture on him all the time. You know, the strength of ego. I'm champion of the world, comma, the whole world. <laughs> and I love that. You know, that sassiness. What trends do you anticipate to, um, that will affect the future growth in the film? The music after hip-hop, because it's slouching its way towards Bethlehem right now. There's something happening. I mean beyond 50 Cent and Kanye West. There's something happening out there. Well, for one thing, in Jamaica, there's a dance that's so powerful and no one knows what to do with it, pasa, pasa. And pasa, pasa, and you see it being done. Whew. The women and guys throw themselves around like volleyballs. The fact that Jamaica it gave us ska, it gave us dance hall, it gave us reggae. And you'd think that would be enough, but no, black culture always on the march. So what will affect future growth in the field of African diasporic studies is precisely the embeddedness of an Afro-Atlantic trait, battles of dance, battles of music, battles of rhyme. You know, that's what hip hop's all about. It's uh, contesting braggadocios. And of course, because it's what keeps everyone on their toes and keeps the stuff evolving. I do a little special drop to the earth and I do it and do it, and then the brother comes, is that all you can do, man? <laughs> well, show me something, bam, bam, bam. And then he gets complacent, is that all you can do? And you can just imagine it. But battles of dance and battles of music is one of the engines that will always keep black culture moving because you can't be complacent. The moment you're complacent, you're dead. Are there any connections between tango and Congo that you were building? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's the whole theory of my book, man. First of all, uh, tango, tanga la la, walk that walk, and stylized and meandering, and the fact that, that Buenos Aires, although there are only maybe 4,000 blacks in a city of 10 million, that doesn't mean they couldn't be influential, because if you think of what happened when the Beatles, who weren't even black, and the, and the Rolling Stone group, they weren't even black, but they picked up the blues and they radiated the entire United Kingdom and pretty soon the whole English-speaking world, the youth of such. The point being that you don't have to have a heavy, black culture is so powerful in itself 
that once you're exposed to it, paradigmatic changes start taking place. But in tango, whew, well, first of all, you can prove the blackness much faster by going to the, the beat just before tango, milonga. And milonga has everything black imaginable. It has hip-hop-like braggadocio lines like, I'm from San Retiro, where blades collide. What I say with my mouth, I back up with my hide. Doesn't that, you can almost imagine 50 Cent saying that? It's a rap. And, and then it gets not only, it, it gets very beautiful. The, the music before the milonga, the habanera, uh, is very beautiful. And it came out of Cuba and spread around the world. And then it hit Buenos Aires. And when you speed it up, the beat of the habanera is dun 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 and you speed it up, dun, 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 it becomes milonga. But the lyrics will blow my mind. I, uh, the Catalan speakers of Spain picked it up from Cuba, and they compose habaneras now in Catalan, like ben vin hut pensament, welcome philosophy. And something la galta, perfume la galta, perfume the side of my face. And leave us a verse. I mean, the elegance of it, you know, welcome philosophy, leave us a verse. They're talking to literature like it was a person. And this kind of elegance goes on in the black world all the time. So, in my opinion, and even just watching your lecture today, it seems like behind all of your scholarship, there's so much joy and there's so much passion. Oh, yeah, I love it. I, I, I'm not ashamed to, to say I love it. And I can't imagine having to put on the melancholy mask of objectivity. <laughs> I am doing this because I think it's a worthy scholarly project. No, man, I'm doing it because black culture, I love it and it saved my life. Do you think that um, having that kind of passion behind the subject is necessary for good scholarly work? That would depend on the scholar. <laughs> How do you define diaspora and particularly? Oh, diaspora? I'm ready to do that. I would define it in black vernacular terms. Uh, Nlungu. Nlungu is Kikongo for Grand Canoe, meaning the slave ship. And in a lot of the New World, where Congo influence is strong, the people that came over in, on the slave ships called each other Nlungus, or they called each other Caravelas in Cuba, from the same caravel, or in Suriname, Mimate, my shipmate. The idea being that the slave ship was a kind of negative fraternity, a negative sorority, that through the horror of it, the, the shared survival, and the shared persistence of culture, dancing and folklore. And, uh, you know, people forget there's a fantastic black artist by the name of Rual uh, Hazume, and he does slave ships that are made out of jugs that are doctored to look like faces. So the boat is a receptacle, and the people are receptacles, so it's receptacle on top of receptacle of receptacle. And it's this brilliant way of reminding us that the slave ships, unlike one version, they were like floating concentration camps, and everyone was lobotomized. You cannot wipe out a black woman's life, a memory of naming children, the fun of playing with the name, and that's something you'll notice a lot of African-American names are made. They're not taken out of a book. Not Celeste, but Solesta, or, well, Condoleezza, yeah? It's the creativity, just the naming children. Oh, that's just one little isotope. And so Hazume, and he was the star of... Uh, a big art exhibition, I believe it was in Kassel in Germany, where you had this long boat, but it was made out of receptacles, doctored to look like masks. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you got the picture. A hundred vessels of memories were coming over. And, and then it becomes like, you know, an affectionate term, mi mate, mi caravela, mi enlungo. But enlungo means the transmission of African minds and imagination 
through the horrors of slavery, but triumphant because you cannot police a guy's mind. Oh, yes, you're so beautiful. Oh, yes. You know, you can pantomime, you know, outward acquiescence, inwardly, totally. And the other powerful thing about diaspora is wherever the diaspora took place, you find the formal goal of religion alive and well, and that's spirit possession. And once the sister goes up, gets happy, or once the guy is no longer Jose Suarez, he's Ogun. And this is the idea of a black scholar. I wish I could remember his name, but it's important that you know it's not me, but this African-American scholar's insight that spirit possession meant liberation because the moment you went up and became the spiritual force, you were no longer a chattel. Nobody owned you. God owned you. Does that make sense to you? Definitely. I'm Cache. Yeah. And my question is, what is the most important thing um, about what you do? I think that hopefully people realize that black culture is forever, and black culture is a parallel classical tradition. And we can study Greek and Romans, but we can also study the Yoruba, the Bakongo kingdom. So what I'm trying to do is show the parallel classical tradition. Hi, I'm Cynthia, and my question is, can you describe one of the most valuable experiences that you had in Africa? Oh, I think the most valuable experience I saw. Well, there were several of them. Watching people honor the memory of this princess in the kingdom of Congo, where they made a giant star in concrete to, to guide her soul and put that concrete star next to the runway of the airport so that she can take off when she needs to. And that is like the blues where um, Robert Johnson says, bury me by the railroad side. No, bury me by the roadside so my spirit can catch that greyhound and ride. There's something about the black value of transition. Going to Chicago, sorry that I can't take you. Traveling, traveling, but transition. Because in the old days, and this to me is one of the most beautiful things about African art, the ability to take a powerful idea and concretize it in a simple little thing, like you take a dime, and pierce a hole in the middle of it and wear it. And outsiders would say, so what? What does that do? A dime is round. Your life is round. You're born, you're flourish. And it's a prayer that you will revolve a long way. And, and it goes with the prayer in Kekongo, Lunga Lukongo do Lunda. May the circle of your life be complete. We want you to live to your 80 or 90 or maybe even 100. And it's a powerful idea. You see traditional black houses in this country will have a couple of tires painted white planked in their front yard. And get back to your question. It's not one moment. It's just the idea that with simple objects, Africans have been able to project intense, complexly inter interwoven philosophic ideas. But, you know, and it's reflected in the heart of our culture. Huckleberry Finn is one of the monuments of American literature. And Huck hung with a black Big Jim. And Big Jim had a nickel that had a hole in it that was worn right over his heart. And Huck asked him, what's that for? He said, given to me by the spirits. And then Huck says, Big Jim got conceited on the fact that he thought the spirits had given him this thing that he wore and it spoiled him as a slave. So this is my last answer, because anything that spoils slavery, I am for, okay? Well, it's good talking to you guys.